This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. everybody and welcome to the carbon revenue panel this afternoon thank you for coming this panel will cover how carbon how auction funds or tax funds can smooth the transition to the green economy my name is Carla Din I'm the Western Regional Director for the Apollo Alliance and we have a treat in store for you today um, this panel will be structured a little bit differently than other panels where we're going to have brief presentations by each speaker followed by a lively friendly debate um, by our panelists. And here today to present to you as a stellar cast of panelists. Uh, to my left is Rafael Aguilera of the Verde Group. He's busily uh, resolving his technical uh, his AV issues. Uh, to my right is Dr. Casey Bishop III from Chevron Corporation. Standing up, not leaving, is Tim Rainey from the California Labor Federation Workforce Economic Development Program. And Chris Bush uh, at the end of the table um, from the Center for Resource Solutions. And I'll give you a little bit more information on their background before each one of them speaks. Now the Congressional Budget Office has estimated uh, that the monetary value of emissions permits that are created by capping greenhouse gas emissions in the United States would range from between 50 billion and 300 billion each year. That's 2007 figures, $2,007 by the year 2020. And similarly, President Obama's 2020 budget pro projects raising a whopping $645 billion from the auctioning of emissions um, between the years 2012 and 2019. And his uh, proposal was to use the bulk of those uh, to benefit the middle class. And as you've heard throughout today, there's great debate about whether um, or not those al allowances should be auctioned off, um, and if so, what percentage um, using those revenue streams for a particular purpose or given away through free allocations. And auctioning would require the large sale ca carbon emission emitters to purchase a permit for each ton of greenhouse gas emissions that they release. And 100% or near 100% auction um, could, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, ensure the investments in a whole host of uh, different uh, whether it's in investment funds for clean energy technology, for uh, support for low income ratepayers, uh, for the um, benefit of the technology modernization for renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, so what we're gonna hear today is a lively debate about all of those topics. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Chris Bush. Um, Chris, is policy director for the Center for Resource Solutions. He was appointed to the Economic and Technology Advancement Advisory Committee for AB 32 implementation, uh, which as you know is the Global Warming Solutions Act, and that committee is otherwise known as ETAC. Um, in 2006, Chris authored the report, Managing Greenhouse Gas Emissions in California, while he was with UC Berkeley's California Climate Change Center. He holds two graduate degrees from UC California, Berkeley, a PhD in environmental economics from the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics, and a master's in public policy from the Goldman School of Public Policy. Let's give him a warm welcome. Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, you know it's going to be a good presentation when you start with a marginal abatement cost curve. but. Um, Basically, this explains why the value of the allowances is, is so large, as Carla referenced. And uh, basically, what this graph shows is the, the red line is a, a marginal abatement cost curve. And, and on the, uh, the x-axis, horizontally moving, is the increasing reductions in, in uh, increasing amount of reductions. So to the far left, you'd have zero reductions and 100% uh, reductions on the far right. Um, this is the... So as, as you get more reductions, the, the cost is going up. So uh, the area to the left is actually, the triangle on the left is representative of the, the cost of, uh, uh, of the reductions that is gonna be uh, induced by climate policy. And on the right, the triangle is the, 
the value of the permits. And basically, the, the amount of emissions that are going to be covered by permits is, is far greater than the amount of reductions we're trying to achieve. And that's, that's where the large value comes about. So um, the bottom here, I'm referencing this paper. It's where I'm getting a lot of my information. It's called The, the Incidents of U.S. Climate Policy. It's by Dallas Bertrand, Resources for the Future. I'd recommend it highly. It talks a lot about these issues. Um, so some of the advantages of auctioning, I'm here to argue for auctioning, although, it, you know, to be honest, I'm sort of taking the easy way out. Uh, my view is the fungibility of allowances and the dollars raised by allowances mean basically you can do anything by, with the dollars raised by auctioning that you can do by giving away allowances. So the punchline is that I believe that these competitiveness issues we're talking about, the leakage concerns are real and we need to address them. But I'll return to that in a minute because there's also a, a, a concern that you could overly compensate the people that are going to be regulated, and, and that would be uh, a problem for for the opportunity cost in the sense of what we could be doing with the money otherwise, uh, instead of uh, giving it to corporations, and which partly means giving it to uh, foreign or uh, foreign shareholders uh, of those corporations. So, basically. Uh, some of the benefits of auctioning are there. It's consistent with uh, the, the uh, notion that the public owns the sky, and we should uh, also sometimes also refer to as the polluter pays principle, and that we should, you know, if we're charging a price, we should actually have that price reflected in in our uh, in the economic decision making. Uh, it avoids windfall profits and uh, problematic incentives. It creates a level playing field for new entrants in, in terms of if you're. For example, if you're giving away allowance for past emissions, that you know that inhibits or that's a disadvantage for new firms that would want to come into the uh, into the market. Uh, it also uh, rewards early action, in the sense that firms that have reduced emissions ha have to purchase fewer allowances. So, uh, those are some of the reasons that I uh, favor auctioning. Let me tell you what the Market Advisory Committee, a body. Uh, created to advise uh, the Air Resources Board had to say about auctioning. It said that, uh, quote, the objectives of cost effectiveness, fairness, and simplicity favor a system in which California ultimately auctions all of its emission allowances. And essentially, the, the, uh, in terms of ultimately getting to 100 percent auction, the, the exception they're holding out for really re revolves around these competitiveness issues. Uh, and, and I think it's important that we take these competitiveness issues into account, uh, but you can also um, go too far in, in, in that. I just wanted to raise, uh, this is a slide from Michael Grubb, he's the chief economist at the, uh, the Carbon Trust in the, in the UK, and it, it, basically what I want to draw your attention to is these are allocation methods in the, uh, in the, in the, in the yellow triangle. And uh, basically, everything except for auctioning has some potential distortion that it induces either uh, excessive carbon intensive capacity, inefficient fuel choice, or less energy efficient investment. So, uh, those are the sorts of distortions you can get if you don't uh, auction. On the competitiveness issue, I just wanted to raise the issue that even while it's important that we don't uh, simply shift jobs and emissions elsewhere, it's also important to point out that you can overstate the ease with which that can happen. You can also give away too many of the permits. That's what happened in the EU, and steel manufacturers gained a windfall of $1.5 billion uh, as a result of that. Basically, they received one-third more permits than they needed to cover their emissions, so that's one way you can create windfall profits. The, the power sector profits, there are an issue of basically not receiving excess permits, but being able to pass along the price of a permit to the consumer. And, um, and so in that sense, the, the, there's sort of an counterintuitive result where you think when you give away the permit, you're going to dampen price effects. But that doesn't turn out to be the case in a lot of instances. And let me just uh, mention an analogy that might help you think about that. There's Think about a World Series ticket and uh, someone selling uh, scalping tickets outside a game. The sort of the underlying demand and supply of the uh, the tickets is what's going to determine the price, not the the means by which the scalper came to hold the ticket. So imagine they found the ticket on the ground; they're not going to sell it for any less, and that's sort of uh, the same dynamic that economists have come to appreciate in in free allocation. It doesn't dampen the price effects. Um, you know, 
Rafael is going to talk about the cap and dividend uh, approach to using revenue. I wanted to just talk briefly about that. And basically, this graph shows by decile, so these are 10%, each 10% increment represents a higher level of income. And the black bars are the costs per household if you don't have any sort of rebate, and the green bars are the costs per household if you have a rebate. So this graph just basically shows that if you give an equal per capita rebate, um, some are calling it a clean energy dividend, if you do that, it's actually uh, the, the bottom half of the households end up better off with that approach. Some have raised concerns about the regional differences in terms of, but it turns out when you look at the regional differences, they're not as large as you might see. These are different regions of the country, and you can see that the cost per household under cap and dividend or clean energy dividend, you basically get a range from about zero to, to 200. Um, you know, maybe we could talk a little bit more about some other cap and invest type alternatives that I think have some attractive features as well. Um, the one nice thing about cap and dividend is it's easier, it's easy to explain and it creates a universal benefit so there could be some greater political uh, popularity for that. And I think I've probably used up my time so I'll stop there. Sorry for talking so fast. Thanks, Chris, for that nice overview. As I mentioned before, these are just really brief presentations that we'll get uh, into more depth later, and you'll have the opportunity to um, ask them questions towards the end. Now, our next speaker is Rafael Aguilera, also known as Rafa. He's principal consultant at the Verde Group, uh, which is a Sacramento-based consulting and lobbying firm specializing in clean energy, climate change, environmental justice, sustainable economics, and Latino policy. Uh, Rafael previously worked at Environmental Defense as a climate policy analyst. Prior to that, he um, was with the California State Assembly as a legislative aide and a Senate fellow at the California State Senate. He was also a key member of the legislative team that passed AB 32. Um, he also served as a junior policy committee consultant for the Senate Energy, excuse me, Environmental Quality Committee under the chairmanship of the environmental champion, Senator Byron Scher. Here's Rafael Aguilera. Thanks for the introduction, Carla. Appreciate working with you two on all this stuff. But um, I'm going to talk to you about carbon pricing. You know, we used to talk about fees, taxes, auctions, and to me it was always a mechanism for putting a price on carbon. And, um, you know, we realized that once you even put a cap on it, you've already assigned value. And so then the next question is, well, what do you do with it? I'm going to get into some of the issues of, um, you know, if you do this, how would you do it in an equitable way? Um, so first off, uh, as stated previously, carbon pricing is basically like a regressive sales tax. And that's because low-income consumers spend more of their disposable income on um, carbon-intensive things like energy, uh, transportation, as a proportion of their income. So a richer person, um, although they make more money, probably use more energy, still spends a smaller amount of their overall disposable income on um, those carbon-intensive goods. Um, and so this raises some fundamental questions about what should be carbon price at all? And I say yes, you know, don't buy into this giveaway, you know, rip offsets is what, is what I call trap of, you know, um, we need to do this on the cheap. We absolutely have to have the lowest cost compliance for industry, and that's going to lead to lower compliance costs for um, people. And that's not necessarily the case, as Chris and others have said before. Second question is, what is the goal of carbon pricing? And to me, it's to achieve uh, this clean energy future and price parity with clean energy. Um, I'll get into that later. And then what's the goal of revenue recycling? To me, it's to um, sort of redress or make whole uh, the inequitable impacts of the carbon price itself. Um, and then how do we mitigate that regressivity? And that's a really good question. It's open for debate, I think, um, the subject of this panel. I'm going to blow through this, but uh, it, it goes without, sh without saying, perhaps, but once you put a cap, that's a little cap, <laughs> on greenhouse gas emissions, there's value created, whereas before there was none. And uh, the tighter the cap that you put, the greater the value. Okay, law of scarcity does that. Um, so the value created could be 100 to 500 billion dollars per year at the federal level. This is nothing to sneeze at. It's a significant amount of money. And like I said earlier, uh, the Congressional Budget Office has analyzed this to, to um, see the various impacts. And uh, basically, they proved that it was regressive, but that if you did uh, a per capita rebate, it would address the regressive impact in, in some way. 
I'm going to go beyond this and talk about other mechanisms. Um, so putting a price on carbon, this is a roadmap, basically, to the clean energy economy. If we progressively price, either through fee, tax, or auction, this is the goal here. We want to achieve um, price parity for clean energy. And can I borrow this from Lori Williams, who is a strong advocate of fee and dividend as well? Um, it's a great quote by Van Jones. That basically, to me, this explains how there's existing inequity in the, the current distribution of um, environmental you know, green assets, if you will, um, and toxic burden. With solar, right, the, something that we're famous for, the California Solar Initiative, this is the distribution of um, PV panels in the state as a result of the program. If I had my pointer, I'd show you this little corner of uh, LA. Uh, can anybody guess what famous zip code it might be? Um, where they're getting all the hot 90210. Exactly. So that's where all the funding has gone for um, solar investments, for example, $3 billion. Energy efficiency, um, this is a study that showed the, the penetration rate, which is you know, how much they've covered, actually, of the people that are eligible. And 2 to, three per, two to 4 percent is, to me, not really sharing the wealth when it comes to um, California's energy efficiency benefits. And you know, we always, uh, it's our claim to fame, right, that we've uh, decoupled um, uh, energy with our economy. And to me, if we're not really benefiting low-income folks like we should, then uh, we have some ways to go. Prius registrations, uh, high concentration in this area, Marin, right? But look inland, uh, the Central Valley, where the longest commutes are. People could uh, really benefit. Parks, another disparity. The pink is, is an area of LA where there is the greatest disparity of um, uh, you know, what we call park-starved communities, people that don't have access to green space or parks. And here in the Bay Area, this is from a Manuel Pastor study, uh, shows the concentration of um, toxic release inventory sites, basically really toxic things like refineries and uh, distribution centers and that kind of thing, and the um, distribution of people of color throughout the Bay Area. So if the green wave is coming, then how are we going to make sure that it lifts all boats? That's really the question here. Certainly not going to be uh, the Lieberman Warner example. This um, bill, which failed last year and resembles this year's bill, uh, was basically the biggest pork barrel um, uh, piece of legislation ever and the largest gift of public trust uh, in the history of the United States government. Um, tons of bailout, uh, tons of money for fossil fuel uh, industry, nuclear energy got some. And all this money comes out of the carbon price, which means it comes out of people's pocketbooks. So to me, if we're not really um, addressing equity, as this is not, we have a long ways to go. Um, examples of things that are equitable to invest in, the per capita rebates, as Chris has stated, show promise of um, not only increasing the longevity of the program because of the fact that it's a universal program, much like Social Security, versus a um, means-tested program like um, food stamps, welfare program. Uh, the second thing is that as the carbon price goes up or the cap comes down, revenues increase and the dividends also increase. Um, and this, another great thing to invest in are what I call green assets or those things that have um, value which are of social or economic environmental value as well as just economic value. Um, so the case for cap and dividend, which is um, something I find myself um, you know, underrepresented uh, in a lot of debates. Um, it, it goes kind of like this. Uh, the first thing is, number one, um, as Professor Holmes stated earlier, the, the, okay, her first name is Holmes, sorry. Um, basically, the sky is, is a gift of creation, okay? And if there's no price on it, it's because the people have not taken the collective property right to enforce that. Um, when we do that by setting caps and stuff, we, we got to make sure that that's the property right that's assigned, not some um, allocation scheme that rewards the dirtiest polluters. Um, second thing is that if we have a high enough carbon price, there'll be very little incentive to trade. And for example, if you're going to build a, a, a building, um, you wouldn't buy two building permits if you only needed one. right? So if you were going to try and cover your emissions for the year, you're going to have a strong incentive to reduce those emissions and not buy excess permits uh, if there's a very high carbon price. 
third is simplicity, right? If you were trying to capture the water droplets, it's just sort of an analogy to uh, reducing greenhouse gases at the point sources, tailpipes and whatnot, wouldn't it be much simpler to just turn off the valve upstream? Um, that's an argument for capping way upstream at the extraction wellhead or the uh, first uh, place of entry into the economy. Um, this is an environmental justice principle that's long been held, uh, polluter pays. If there's some uh, damage done to the public trust or the environment or public health, who should be assigned that, that cost to mitigate that? Um, polluter pays. And then what to do with that money? Because it, it will be created. Uh, you have three choices, basically, if you boil it down. Polluters, you know, giving it away based on historical emission levels. Um, giving it to the government and trusting that something good will happen from it. Cap and auction or cap and invest. Uh, or cap and dividend, which is investing in basically everyone's collective right to a, a, a stable climate. The financial argument. Um, this, this could be taken one of two ways, and these are some back of the envelope calculations that I've done uh, based on the ARB's recommendations for phasing in a cap program. Um, in the blue boxes, you can either look at that as money that's taken out of each individual's pocket or money that is basically rebated to the person's individual pocket. So in the year 2020 and 2050, th this is a significant amount of money. I mean, $1,600 per household um, in these tough economic times could really you know, impact if it doesn't go back to them, and if it goes back to them, it could really help keep them whole. A lot to say in these numbers, but I'll pass through. Um, the AB32 legal argument is that uh, any market mechanism must be designed so that the distribution of allowances are equitable, and equal um, distribution of the benefits to me is, is one of the best answers of what, is equi what does equity mean in this case. Um, and this is a really, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't completely back this up, but it's been made by not just me. And it's that, um, you know, AB 32 didn't really pass as a two-thirds majority vote bill, and so it didn't authorize taxes. But 100% rebate is not necessarily a tax because it's not revenue generating, um, it's not a revenue generating, generating activity. Um, so under the Sinclair Paint decision, which says you have to only, if you can only raise a fee for mitigation of um, the harm caused by that activity that you're feeing against, this is one way of getting around both the Sinclair Nexus but also the, um, the, the tax um, issue. Um, one big question that I always get is, you know, what, why cap and dividend if we, should, we could just invest in green jobs and um, worker training and public transportation and all these things? And one of the reasons is because dividends themselves are actually taxable and you can, and 24% and of the money would actually come back through federal and state um, governments via income taxes, sales taxes, because this money is basically recycled. Um, and then that money, okay then that money could then be used on anything without uh, having to bear a nexus to the actual fee. So green jobs, public transit, clean energy, resource adaptation, all these things are possible. Green assets, let me just give the definition of it. Um, to me, it's anything that has a social, environmental, economic value that is owned by an individual or a community. And in this case, it could be solar, which is an example of prepaid energy investment, free fuel for life, you know, the, the panel parks, which you know, we know there's some disparities in, and provide clean air benefits and uh, public health benefits and uh, clean ways to get to work and school and those types of things. Um, so you know, to me, with the um, carbon revenue on the table, it's been treated, I think, sort of like a green pinata. You know, everybody's <laughs> taking a whack at it, and everybody's scrambling for the candy. Um, but to me, it, since this all comes out of people's pocketbooks, I wonder if those investments are going to be geared towards addressing the regressivity problem. And I think we can do it if we have this, uh, this appropriate mix. But um, you know, this is a conversation that we all have to have. And I think the authentic dialogue that we're, that we're having today is really uh, one of the first steps. So I thank you guys for your time. And any questions? Thank you very much, Rafael, for talking about the important co-benefits of climate policy. And no discussion of climate policy would be complete without the industry perspective. I think the progressive community needs to hear that. And uh, we have a, a very stellar speaker today to give us um, the perspective of one such local corporation, and that is Chevron Corporation. Uh, Dr. Casey Bishop III is a senior consultant 
uh, U.S. state and local relations, public and government affairs for Chevron Corporation. He's headquartered in Sacramento, California. Um, and, and he pointed out he's been working on climate issues for the last 22 years, which is quite impressive. Um, he's been a corporate advocate and actively participates in policy uh, debates on environmental issues and regularly testifies on legislation before the California legislature and the executive branch. Um, in 1981, he joined the environmental and health protection staff of Chevron Chemical Company. In this capacity, he organized Chevron's or program for hazardous waste site cleanup and instituted um, compliance to protect human health and the environment from the potential hazards of the dis uh, excuse me of waste disposal requirements. Casey has quite an interesting and varied background. He's a member of the American Chemical, Chemical Society, the Air and Waste Management Association, the Environmental Defense Fund, um, and he also serves on the California Wildlife Federation, uh, Solar Cookers International, which I'd like to talk to him about later, and the Tahoe Baikal Institute. Here is Dr. Casey Bishop. Thank you, Carla. And uh, Raphael set the stage by talking about the pinata. I'm the pinata. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you for mentioning that uh, Chevron is a local company. We've been in California for 135 years. And because of that, we have more at stake than almost anyone. Uh, we're the largest producer of petroleum in the state. Uh, we're the largest refiner. We have two big refineries, one at El Segundo and one in uh, Richmond, California. And they're world-scale refineries. And we're, depending on which month it is, either the first or second largest marketer of petroleum products in the state. Uh, probably more relevant for the uh, labor community is that we, in the state right now, employ about 10,000 people, plus or minus, depending on exactly what week it is. And those are full-time employees, and about a third of those, maybe 30 percent, are good blue-collar union jobs. And a good balance of the rest of them are professionals, mostly engineers, lots of scientists, lots of MBAs, and actually very few lawyers. We, uh, in California, uh, are very concerned because we are part of California. We've been here in the non-carbon world, which is about to change, so that when people start talking about putting uh, fees on what our emissions have been, it really has a huge impact to our company. And probably the best example is, and we've looked at what, our, you know, what we think it's going to cost us to change things in our refinery. If it turns out it's $35 a met million metric tons, that it will, it's going to cost us about uh, half a billion dollars a year for, for, an for our allocations. And if it gets up around $75, then we're talking about a billion dollars a year. So we're talking about huge amounts of money relative to the amount of money we make in California that we potentially would have to pay out. And that has huge competitive uh, implications. And those implications uh, are very real. People talk about uh, leakage. Well, we had a big project that we were planning on building in, at El Segundo in our El Segundo refinery. And it was a new uh, innovative way to convert heavy oil, which the world is now using, into light products, gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. Uh, it was going to produce CO2 emissions, so, you know, significant CO2 emissions. It was a project that would have cost about half a billion dollars, and it was a lot like, uh, you know, a sort of a half a refinery or a quarter of a refinery. It would have employed, you know, somewhere between uh, eight and ten people uh, on three shifts, so it would have been, you know, 25 to 30 people uh, around the clock. Uh, that project, because of the CO2 uh, emissions and with the passage of AB 32, is being built right now in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And it had been on the books for El Segundo, California. The uh, 
the leakage doesn't start when they actually pass it. It has a chilling effect right now in California on any investment. So getting the rules out and getting them clear right away is really important. Now, you know, when I say something like that, I think everybody's likely to think that, well, of course, I work for an oil company, Chevron's against, you know, AB 32. We did oppose it. We thought it was very silly to do it as a state. But once it passed, we've been doing everything we can to try to do it as effectively as we, as we can. Uh, the, uh, the economists, many of them, with the exception of one, of one or two ARB economists, have all estimated that doing the kind of things we need to do to prevent climate change are going to cost us one or two percent, depending on how well you do it or how efficiently you do it, of the uh, gross state product or the gross domestic product for the world. Uh, the Stern report said the same thing, but they all justify it by talking about the long-term benefits and the fact that society will be clearly better off if we make the investments now, and we're not quibbling with that. In that regard, Chevron actually supported the uh, adoption of the scoping plan that ARB adopted. Uh, we supported the LCFS, the uh, low carbon fuel standard, because we think strategically for our nation and for the world doing something with transportation fuels is important to do. And we're not, uh, we're not saying that we shouldn't do auctions ever or that 100 percent auctions should never happen ever. But I think we have to realize that we're in a transition phase from the sort of older petroleum coal economy to the more modern, how are we, gonna, how are we going to maintain our society and using greener energy? That isn't going to happen overnight. And I think probably the EU is the uh, best example. You know, there have been so many people that have been talking about 100 percent auctions or 100 percent carbon taxes for the last 15 years, and yet nobody's really doing it. And even in phase two of the EU ETS, they're now looking at how you would actually do allocations in a, in a different way. Uh, there's been sort of a false uh, choice that's been set up. And it's, it really talks about in 2020 or 2025, whatever year you're in, should we have 100 percent auctions or not? Well, if you've had that transition period, a lot of the economists will tell you, yes, we ought to be doing uh, something that's efficient, and that would be auctions or taxes. But if you do that, the economists always also say, which seems to get lost in the uh, translation, that you have to take those revenues that you get and actually efficiently recycle them back into the economy. Otherwise, it'll have a regressive effect on capital investment in the economy of either the state or the, or the country. And that doesn't necessarily mean going out and subsidizing things that are, you know, good for society, but may not be good for actually generating the wealth that society needs. Uh, the false choice is between basically giving out free allocations, which are basically described as grandfathering, which means you get credit for having, for being dirty. And that particularly bothers Chevron. We don't want grandfathering either. We actually want to see somebody do it like the EU is talking about, where if you're an industry that actually exists in a competitive world, and oil refining certainly does, then the way to do it is by benchmarking. I mean, our two refineries in California are two of the cleanest, most efficient refineries in the world. And, you know, grandfathering would actually be very, very difficult for us. By the same token, having us have to buy our uh, allocations would be a huge penalty for having invested in the state of California and help, help, helping our economy grow. So we'd like to see benchmarking as the transition to ultimately having either taxes or, or auctions, but we have to realize there's going to be a transition period. This isn't going to be, uh, I don't know if, how many people have, were here when the slide went up when the guy was, when the fellow was talking about uh, Darwin. 
but I just came back from the Galapagos Islands where I was reading about, there's one little island called Daphne Major where they studied the finches. You know, you gotta be a nerd ball to do this. But anyway, I was reading about it. The guy won the Pulitzer Prize for the book, actually. But the most interesting thing was one drought changed all the rules. And it was very, very hard on the population of that island. I mean, yeah, they changed things, but it was just very, very hard on the species that existed on the island. So we have to admit we're going to have a transition. We have to take our time doing it. And we need to be cognizant that the people that have invested in California shouldn't be punished. So thank you. Thank you very much, Casey, for that perspective. And you'll hear a lot more of that after Tim Rainey gives his presentation. I've known Tim for the past oh, four years now. He's a, a stalwart activist for the protection of workers, um, and not to mention his unique sense of humor. He always keeps us laughing. Um, he's the director of the Workforce Economic Development Program for the California Labor Federation, and uh, otherwise known as WED. Their primary work is policy development at the state and local issue excuse me, state and local levels, um, brokering industry-based training partnerships among unions, employers, community organizations, educational institutions, and public workforce agencies. Um, Tim previously was the policy director for the California Workforce Association. He advocated there on behalf of local workforce investment boards and legislative policy and administrative deliberations in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. Um, prior to joining CWA, he was a consultant to the Senate Democratic Caucus of the California State Senate. Um, he's also a co-founder and executive committee member of the EDGE Campaign, a proud member of the California Apollo Alliance Steering Committee. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree in government from California State University, Sacramento. Here's Tim to give the worker perspective. Just a, just a couple things first. I, I want to acknowledge the, the UC Berkeley Labor Center for its extraordinary work and leadership on, uh, on under, helping us understand AB 32 implementation, how it's going to impact workers and communities, um, and, and for putting on this event, um, which, is a, which is another step in a long series of work they've done. So <laughs> think about Andrea Buffa. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge uh, Jim Bino with the machinist who was on the last panel uh, is, is in the audience, uh, still awake, I hope. Uh, uh, Jim is on our executive council, the California Labor Federation, and chairs our uh, Green Jobs Committee. Uh, and and Jim, Jim's a leader, and we're proud to have him uh, really pushing the envelope on this stuff. Um, so um, I'm kind of the workforce economic development person at the Labor Federation, so everything I, I sort of think about is through that, that lens. Um, so in preparing for this, my thoughts as I drove in from Sacramento, uh, you know, I was sort of thinking about uh, the massive amounts of dollars that are going to be available through um, this process of uh, carbon pricing and, uh, and cap and trade. Uh, you know, it's going to be a different amount depending on what kind of system we get to. If we phase in an auction, we go 100 percent auction right off the bat or whatever. There's going to be hopefully some amount of money at the state level uh, to reinvest in, in, in our economy and our people. Um, I think it was mentioned, Carla said it could be $50 billion. It could be more. Is that sort of uh, a conservative estimate, $50 billion? That's an extraordinary amount of money. Uh, so again, the workforce uh, um, perspective on this, uh, the federal commitment to job training uh, in California amounts to about $500 million a year. Uh, and the Recovery Act dumped about 100% more money into our economy, just one-time funding. So $500 million, that's the entire federal commitment to job training. Um, we've got another uh, state uh, training program called the Employment Training Panel. It's about $50 million a year. Uh, our total commitment in the state of California, uh, state funds and federal funds, not including the 12, uh, K-12 system, amounts to about $4 billion a year. So we're talking $50 billion in new revenue a year uh, at the state level that we can reinvest. If you took just 10% of that, you're already matching dollar for dollar nearly what our, what our current expenditure is on job training. Um, so I'm excited. Uh, about the potential of a, of a, of a cap and auction. Uh, I've learned a lot, of, um, I should say, from the panelists. And I didn't have time to work their stuff into my comments, so I'll just ignore what they said. Um, and you can ask questions later. Uh, so I'll try to be really quick, because I know Chris has been chomping at the bit to get after Casey, uh, so I, I want to let that happen. Um, so first of all, uh, just kind of 
overriding principles on how to invest this funding. Uh, real quick, number one, it's got to be targeted to have impact. Uh, two, uh, let's build on existing programs, uh, uh, government programs, uh, and not create a bunch of new ones because um, it's a waste of money, and we already do that. Um, connect strong labor standards to this funding. It's public dollars, um, so it should be invested in ways that helps to rebuild the middle class. We've got a great opportunity to do that, so connecting labor standards. We can talk more about it if you want to. Um, it was brought up last panel, and, and it sort of went into a quagmire, so maybe we shouldn't talk about that. Um, and, and finally, uh, create a carbon trust. Uh, I, I like what Holmes Hummel says often. This is one of uh, my favorite quotes of hers. Each carbon allowance received by a company is a public subsidy. Hell yeah, it is, right? Uh, and so that revenue generated uh, through the auctioning of pollution credits should be considered a public good. Um, the revenue then uh, of this, uh, this system that we create, uh, assuming we do it, um, should be uh, overseen um, by the public um, very closely, and, and in my mind, that means a carbon uh, trust or an advisory committee at the state level looking at ways of investing this money uh, that helps us transition to a green economy, but also helps people transition to a green economy. Um, so use, possible uses of funds. I'll just go through a quick list so we can get to, to questions and stuff. Um, worker transitions, uh, worker transition, uh, critical. Uh, the implementation of AB 32 uh, is going to cause um, a lot of uh, disruption in core industry sectors in California. And as Casey mentioned, uh, these are the sectors that have the highest union density and the most good jobs, uh, middle class jobs in the state, right? It's manufacturing, transportation, uh, construction, energy. Um, all of these industries are going to have to do a, a great deal of work and investment in uh, complying with new regulations because of AB 32. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of need to invest in people, um, in skill upgrading especially. We ask what a green job is. Well, every green job, every job rather in those sectors is going to be a green job, right? It's, it's absolutely true. Um, so we've got to really invest in skill upgrading these folks so they can stay competitive, so they can help the companies make the transition to a green economy. Um, we're also going to lose some jobs. So we've got to invest in those people who are getting laid off because of this implementation of uh, AB 32 so they can get retraining and find, find new jobs. So a uh, good worker transition program may be modeled on uh, the federal uh, TAA, which is uh, uh, the... Uh, Transition assistance, um, sorry, I always forget that what that acronym is. I, I work in acronyms, so I usually forget what the hell they mean. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, you can have my coffee. Um, and then uh, number two, no, you can't. I got to have your coffee. Uh, number two, uh, revolving loan fund. And this is, a, I'm not making all this stuff. This is actually, uh, uh, these are principles that, uh, and ideas that our executive council came up with and have been ensconced in a letter to the Air Resources Board. Um, revolving loan fund um, to provide low-cost capital uh, loans uh, to industry uh, to help the transition happen, um, to adopt new technologies, processes, uh, uh, machinery, um, and also to help job training programs uh, make the transition. Um, I was talking to uh, folks at a training program with the operating engineers, heavy equipment operators, uh, and he, they were talking about the incredible cost of retrofitting their existing equipment just in a job training program. What, and what that would mean for them. They've got, none, they've got no kind of money to make this transition. Uh, so we've got to have monies available to invest in, 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 in across the board. Uh, I would like to see uh, sort of a LIHEAP, uh, uh, California style, federal LIHEAP is, uh, LIHEAP is, I know this acronym, Low Income uh, Home Energy Assistance Program. I'm no expert in it, uh, but some kind of uh, uh, energy cost assistance for, for folks, especially low income, maybe 200, 300 percent of the poverty uh, level, um, who are going to be experiencing uh, higher utility rates. We know this is going to happen. Um, uh, expand residential weatherization. One of the great things about the Recovery Act is uh, a massive, a tenfold investment in weatherizing homes. Um, we could do much better. We could spend a lot more money on, on weatherizing homes. Uh, I was talking to the folks who are administering this program at the state level, uh, saying that it's not going to be a substantial increase in the number of homes that get weatherized, and it's not going to mean a whole lot of new jobs, despite what we all kind of think about it. Um, but if we invest a lot more, um, we can cover a lot uh, more of California. And we shouldn't do it house by house. We should look at zip codes. We know where the low-income uh, neighborhoods are and do economies of scale and really focus on big chunks of homes uh, and, and weatherize as much of the state as we can. It creates jobs. It brings down energy costs, uh, and, it's, and, it, and it reduces uh, carbon emissions. Um, and then finally, Expand healthy families or some other health care program uh, to cover, if not, 
if not all people, most people. We've got to figure out a way of decoupling uh, health uh, insurance from employers. We have an employer-based uh, system nationwide. Um, we have incredible churn in the economy, though. Every time somebody gets disconnected from an employer, they lose access to their health insurance. They've got to find their way back into the labor market, and they usually lose their health benefits in addition to some of their income. Um, as we've got terrible volatility now. There's something like a million job separations every month in just California before the downturn, which is extraordinary. You can see what it does to the middle class. 17% drop in income every time you leave the labor market and got to make your way back in. Um, this AB32 implementation is going to create more churn. Uh, so we got to look for ways of su uh, supporting workers through transitions uh, like decoupling health insurance from employers. Um, and I think I should say one more thing. Um, I'm stealing this from Van Jones because Rafa mentioned Van. Uh, we have to spend a lot more money on job training. Uh, and this is, this is uh, what I heard Van Jones say uh, before um, uh, the Vice President's Committee on, on, on Middle Class. I can't remember what the committee Do you remember what the committee's called, the Vice President's Committee on the Middle Class? Middle, it's called Middle Class. Middle Class Task Force, thanks. Uh, so Van says, um, for someone trying to do the right thing, um, to get a job and support his or her family, we can't seem to come up with $6,000 for a six-month or 12-month job training program. This is extraordinary. Uh, we have a hard time funding training for individuals in this state and across the country. Somehow $6,000 is too much money. Um, but as soon as that person screws up, we won't hesitate to incarcerate that person for 10 times that amount of money, uh, roughly the equivalent of a year at Harvard. Um, and so we need a new math, as Van Jones says. We need to invest the money where it's best spent to support workers. Uh, and we got to do it in a way that actually makes sense to, to, that's to scale uh, to the need of transition uh, in our economy. So I'll, I'll say no more. I wanted to dedicate the rest of the, the time to a spirited debate on issues that I think uh, might be on all of your minds but we're afraid to ask. <laughs> Now, the Waxman-Markey Energy Climate Bill um, involves lobbying efforts by the refineries uh, at the national level. The refineries are asking for a 30 percent free allocation of credits. And I'd like to start this off by, by posing this to, uh, to any of our panelists, of course, <laughs> namely Casey and, and probably Chris with, with uh, input by Raphael and Tim. How is this not perceived as windfall? profits, and how do you view that as being for the public good? Well, as I think I said, I mean, you made the investments in a pre-carbon world, and so to turn around tomorrow and say that you were going to have to pay 100% uh, for your allocations would be very disruptive, and in fact, it would be an immediate cost that would lead to leakage. The, uh, it's not to say that you can't have a long-term transition, and uh, that's what I was trying to say. You need it because otherwise the disruptions that you'll cause in our economy and to our industry are huge. I mean, if you're in California, uh, you're part of the Pacific Rim and there's huge refineries in India and in Thailand, uh, South Korea. I mean, every one of those people can and will be happy to ship gasoline components into California and we're going to compete with them. I guess I would just mention that, um, uh, I mean, in 1991, we had the Rio summit, which was the signed by George H.W. Bush, you know, which st started the, the debate going. And so, I mean, Casey mentioned, mentioned himself, he's been working on this for a long time. So I don't think, I don't know when the pre-carbon world started, but I think it's, it's, it's too late to say that it's, it's not already happening. So I don't know when the right, time to put the, you know, when investments were reasonably made or, or not, but um, I think one of the issues, is, I mean, where these profits come through is the ability to pass through costs. So um, I know, uh, you know, when we look at gasoline, for example, it's a fair, it's not very responsive to price. So the way I think about it is, you know, th the cost of a permit is really recognizing pollution is essentially an input to production. And when I've seen what happens in the industry, the oil industry, when the price of crude goes up, that's, a, that's, a, that's another uh, input to production. They, they can just pass that along to the consumer. So um, 
I mean, I, I don't doubt that Casey's numbers of $500 billion of these large payments are what they might cost for the permits, but there's this issue of the extent to which they can pass along those costs as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, you know, the leakage problem in some ways is just the typical commons problem. I mean, if everybody in the world was doing it, it makes a lot of sense. But the fact is the margins on gasoline are very small, as, as I know you know. And, you know, if, uh, if it's costing us $20 a ton is a nickel a gallon. So if it's 75 cents, you know, you're starting to get into way more than the average margin on a gallon of gasoline. And basically that means if the prices go up, you're sending the, you know, we'll be making it somewhere else and shipping it in because we won't be able to compete. We'll be, we'll be, we'll just get drowned. I mean, California in 2020 was a net exporter of gasoline and had been forever. Now we're, even with the recession, we're a net 15% importer. It'll just get worse, and it'll get worse fast. Um, a quick comment, basically. I mean, I think this is really a moment of opportunity, I think, as Manuel Pastor said earlier in the session. Um, we're realizing the extent that you know, corporate globalization has uh, only led to very negative impacts in the third world developing nations, um, and privatization of natural resources, public resources, has led to severe exploitation and inequality of uh, income. And without forethought of the future, you know, capitalism doesn't really provide for the future generations unless we set some parameters around it. And to me, what that means is we need to invest in some type of commons, a global commons, as you said, because all environmental problems are really um, fundamentally about resource management. Uh, you know, unequal distribution, and if we don't preserve the climate in a level that is um, respectful to the future generations, we're really doing them a disservice. And so I would hope that the reason why, you know, I promote cap and dividend is because it really would radically change the way people think about public assets, and in, 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 in this particular case, climate as an asset, a stable climate, that is. You know, I just as, uh, and I, I think we'll probably all agree on this, just as uh, I said, whatever we do shouldn't be precipitous and, uh, you know, basically hurt industry. By the same token, you don't want to hurt uh, uh, the, the, the less fortunate people in our society. You don't want to hurt the workers in our economy. So you have to have a transition. And, you know, obviously there's going to be dividends that you can spend on something. I guess the question, you know, we have so many people with so many good ideas of how to spend that money. And I think you have to keep in mind that when those costs start to be more than the cost of actually, you know, controlling the emissions, that, you know, you're, you're starting to get out into the thing that, that it's really society is choosing to do something with a tax. And if I understood Chris's box at the very first slide, I and pay attention, Chris, because I'm not sure I did, then, you know, if you, once you get out past like 2020 or whatever the date was, uh, when you start having to get the big reductions, then the free allocations start to be uh, maybe more than the cost of reducing. But in that short term, uh, they're not. And, that's when you need to be thinking about if there if there are things that are being monies that are being siphoned off. How do you how do you use those in an intelligent way so you can really plan for this you know transition, which is probably going to be 10 or 20 years. Yeah, I think it flips around 33 and a half percent where the the costs exceed the revenue. Did you want to say anything more, Chris? Well. Not on that per se. I, I wanted to disagree with a couple of things that Casey said on, on auctioning being a uh, around for 10 or 15 years. It may have been mentioned, but I saw Michael Grubb, the UK chief economist for the, the, the UK Carbon Trust, excuse me, and he, he presented really the, the importance of auctioning as one of the main lessons from the EU ETS. And, and even though they are locked into 
because of their previous decisions to a low level of auctioning in this phase going through 2008 to 2012, they're going to be auctioning about 4%. Starting in 2013, they're going to be auctioning 15% and going up from there. Um, also just, you know, I don't want to get into the debate of the, the how much it's going to cost, but I would just say it's not one or two carb economists. One of those studies came from UC Berkeley, and there's really been, for years, there's been a fundamental debate between economists who believe that markets are close to perfect and close to, you know, perfectly competitive and rational, and who assume that there can't be any, any, any economic gains from policy versus engineers who look at more of a bottom-up view and don't assume that markets are close to a perfect efficiency, uh, you know, close to their efficiency potential. So I, I think it is actually a much more uh, nuanced debate than, than, than that. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, th the big question is when and how you sum the, uh, uh, the savings from being energy efficient. And uh, the fellow who did the study, whose name I forget, the economist, said that, and I quote, as long as all the assumptions that ARB gave me are true, then my results are correct. Well, it's also, if you look at the cost curve constructed by Jim Sweeney at the Stanford, you know, Precourt Institute, they come up with a, a marginal abatement curve with about half of the reductions are, are negative costs, so they produce savings. So it's not just the ARB that's saying that policy can actually improve, have economic gains up to a point. Yeah, no, the big question, I mean, the, the real problem is, not the real problem, the real question is when you, you have to make massive investments at the beginning to get the, trans, to, to get the transition, and, you know, that has, you know, immediate costs. I mean, it's the argument of the Stern Commission, right, that you, you make investments and you improve society, but you have to make investments, and that takes money away from other things. All right, at that, I'd like to thank our panelists, and a special thanks to Casey for being in the hot seat. I know it was not that easy. <laughs> Thank you.